So the first thing I wanted to say is that I'm the only person who's supposed to be standing up. So if you guys want to come down and sit on the floor or something, you know, or, or, or whatever. Anyway, st stand only if you have to. <laughs> okay, so I can't remember what the actual title that I told you I was going to use. But anyway, this is going to be about big data. And so the way, I, the way I like to think of it is that you've got a big data problem if you've got one of the three V's. Uh, the first one is you've got too much, too much data and you're having a hard time managing it. Uh, the second is it's coming at you too fast and you can't keep up. And the third one is it's coming at you from too many places and you've got a data integration problem. And so I'm going to talk about these three uh, cases. They're all totally different. And inside big volume, I'm going to talk about two different use cases, uh, one having to do with business intelligence and the other having to do with data science. And I'm going to try and give you a bunch of opinions as to what I think of uh, the various uh, offerings in all three of these categories. So if you've got a lot of data and all you want to do is SQL analytics, meaning business intelligence, stuff that you call business intelligence, I know of a couple dozen production database systems managing multiple petabytes of data in this world, running day in, day out, uh, and you know, on a variety of, of software platforms. So the biggest one I know of is a company called Zynga. Uh, those are the guys who do Farmville. I can safely say I have never played Farmville but apparently lots of you do. So every time that there's any click in any Zynga game, including Farmville, they're recording that click in a Vertica data warehouse. It's about five petabytes right now, running on several hundred servers. And it's uh, used by the business analysts at Zynga to try and figure out how to sell you more virtual goods. So if all you want to do is business intelligence, go get a commercial uh, data warehouse product. Uh, they will, they are all, or a bunch of them, are good at scale. However, the one thing I want to point out is there's been a dramatic sea change in the last 10 years. So if you went and looked at the data warehouse products in the year 2005 or so, they were all what are called row stores, which is if you looked at the disk the next thing in storage was the same record and the next attribute over. So every single data warehouse product, I listed a bunch of them at the bottom of the slide, they were all row stores. Uh, if you go and look today, uh, essentially everybody has converted to a column store. So the next thing in storage is the same attribute but in the next record. So take a row store and rotate it 90 degrees, and that's what's being done now. So there's been a complete market shift from row stores to column stores. So why has that happened? Well, column stores are about 50 times faster than row stores in data warehouse uh, queries that people want to run. So if you're selling a row store, you're up against a technological barrier that's a couple orders of magnitude. So beginning around 2005, uh, I'd like to say Vertica had something to do with this. Uh, it's caused a complete shift in the market. And essentially, all the successful vendors are all going to have to run shared nothing, scalable, multi-node column stores. And most everybody, and Oracle is a glaring exception, in the last 10 years has converted from what they used to have to uh, a column store. So Oracle, which is touting a thing called Exadata, uh, Oracle is not a column store, even though their marketing message is we're a hybrid thing. Well, they're not a column store. They're a row store. They're also not a scalable shared nothing architecture. Uh, and so, but everybody else, essentially everybody else, has moved to, to the right side of this technological shift. And so Vertica is there, IBM DB2 Blue is there, uh, Redshift is there, dot, dot, dot. So if you want to run uh, successfully 
in the business intelligence world, go get a column store. And please, for goodness sake, don't run a row store. Uh, a row store, if it can answer a query in an hour, then the same query is answerable, answerable uh, in a column store in a minute. So do you want to have an hour response time or a minute response time? So this market is alive and well, uh, and column stores are selling very well. However, in my opinion, that's yesterday's news. So um, most people are predicting that business intelligence is going to go away and morph into something called data science. So uh, the way to think about this is that uh, suppose you're Walmart. Well, Walmart is recording every click of any time any, any wand goes over a product in any checkout line. Uh, every time that happens, a record is entered into a data warehouse in Bentonville, Arkansas. So if you're a business analyst, you can find out anything you want to and produce a big table of numbers. So if you're the person who's responsible for stocking uh, stores after, after hurricanes and before hurricanes, you can say, well, there were four hurricanes in the uh, hurricane season in 2007 in Florida. So what's sold in the week before the hurricane? What's sold in the week after the hurricane? Compare all that with same store sales in Georgia. You get a big table of numbers. So that's what a business intelligence guy will do, is produce you a big table of numbers. Data scientists won't do that at all. He'll give you a predictive model that will predict sales uh, you know, from, some, from some model. Would you rather have a predictive model or a big table of numbers? Uh, anyone in their right mind will take the predictive model. And so you look at how uh, data science guys are building predictive models, and they're doing all kinds of stuff. They're, you know, it goes under terms like machine learning, data clustering, uh, trend detection, uh, <coughs> regression, dot, dot, dot. If you open up the codes that are underneath that stuff, uh, this is all linear algebra on arrays. This is what these guys are all using. This is not SQL. It's not SQL aggregates. This is totally different. And you open up the codes, and they're all based on a few uh, you know, primitive operations, of which matrix multiply is probably the most popular. So in case you don't believe me, I just want to go through a quick example accessible to all of you. So if you're a quant on Wall Street and you're trying to do electronic trading, then one of the things you'd like to do is to say, well, uh, is Ford stock price correlated with General Motors stock price? So I have the closing uh, price on all trading days for the last 20 years if I'm any uh, one of these investment houses. So the first thing you do is to say, well, why don't I uh, compute the covariance between these two time series uh, if it's plus one, they're highly correlated. If it's minus one, they're negatively correlated. If it's zero, they're uncorrelated. And then I could use that in my trading strategy. So the red stuff at the bottom is the covariance of these two, of these two time series, which I call A and B. Well, that's uh, something you can compute on your wristwatch. So let's make it a little more interesting and say there are 4,000 or so securities on the New York Stock Exchange. I want to do an all pairs covariance. So this typical data mining task, what's correlated to what? So I've got this matrix, which is 4,000 stocks. Those are the rows in this red thing. And five years of data is about 1,000 trading days. So there's a column for every trading day. And so closing prices are, that, are this red matrix. And I want to do an all pairs covariance. You know, about the simplest kind of data science analytics you can think of. Well, if I ignore the constants and ignore worrying about subtracting off the mean, what I want to compute is that red matrix, matrix multiply times its transpose. So that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, this is not SQL. This is not on tables. This is on arrays. So fundamentally, I'm in a completely different world than I was in with business intelligence. 
Okay, so this is the, this is the problem I want to look. At. This is the problem coming at you, if you're a data, if you're a database type, is how am I going to support these data science types? Well, what exactly do data scientists want to do? Well, the first thing they do is, I'm embarrassed to say, they spend at least 90% of their time finding and cleaning the data that they want to analyze. Uh, this is uh, something I'll talk about more under the variety problem, but this is what they spend all of their time on. So the most important way to support a data scientist right now is figure out how to help him with finding and cleaning his data. Once he gets done doing that, then he engages in the following loop. Until he gets bored or gets to go home, uh, he does some data management operations, like try this all pairs covariance just for stocks with a market cap over a billion dollars. Or try this for stocks uh, for those companies that are headquartered in Michigan or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. For that set that I've identified, do something, uh, do some complex analytics. So this is the loop that you engage in as a data scientist. This is the, pro the coming problem that uh, is going to be the big volume problem. Okay, so the use case you're trying to deal with is support complex analytics. Covariance is just the simplest thing you can do. Uh, and it just goes up from there. This is essentially all defined on arrays. There are a bunch of people who want to do computations on social networking graphs. Uh, there's a fair amount of discussion as to exactly how you want to treat graphs. My point of view is graphs, the incidence matrix is just a matrix representation of a graph. I'm happy just to compute on sparse arrays. So I view this as just more array problems. Uh, you've got to do data management and you've got to scale. So you've got to scale to many cores, many nodes, and to problems whose size won't fit in main memory. Because the most interesting thing I find about data scientists, the minute you can solve their problem, they give you a bigger one. So the minute you can solve this all pairs covariance for the NYSC closing prices, they say, the data scientist says, well, what I really meant was I want you to do it on hourly data, which is 10 times as big, or I want to do it on all stocks on the planet rather than just on the NYSC. Or if you can manage to do that, they say, well, I really want to do it for the Chicago Board of Options uh, securities, which sends it up by another order of magnitude. So the minute you can solve anybody's problem, they give you a bigger one. So scalability is a huge, huge issue. Okay, so how are you gonna solve this problem? Well, the first thing you can do is to say, well, uh, I go, you go talk to data scientists now, they say, well, I like this stuff called R, or I like this stuff called Julia, or SAS has a fair amount of, of users, or MATLAB, or dot, 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 SPSS run a stat package. The trouble with stat packages is that they have essentially no data management. So they'll do one piece of your problem, but not the other. Uh, also, uh, from, the, from where I sit, stat packages have an annoying problem, which is they're just based on files. There isn't any consistent metadata. There isn't any notion of sharing. All the stuff that you get with a database system is usually not there. So you say, well, maybe I should run a database system. So I should try out Oracle on this problem. Uh, if you do that, you're likely to uh, tear your hair out because uh, your database system will have weak or non-existent linear algebra. So it'll do the data management, but not the uh, linear algebra. So what everybody does right now, everybody means most everybody, is they run two systems. They run Oracle to do the data management. When you find out what you want, you copy it over to R, and then you run the linear algebra in R, and then you copy the answer back. So that gives you the necessity of running two systems. No one wants to learn two systems and do the plumbing back and forth. And you're moving the world around and turning over the gross national product to your networking vendor. 
So this is the current technology which nobody but nobody likes to do. So can you do better? Well, I'm a huge fan of one size doesn't fit all. This is fundamentally an array problem. Why don't you just have an array database system? What is an array database system? It's, it's simply, it's not a table system. It's not anything simulated on top of SQL. It's a system from the ground up that stores arrays. And you want SQL operations. Of course, SQL is the intergalactic language. You just do them on arrays. And you have built-in analytics of the sort that you need to solve data science problems. So go take a look at SciDB uh, if you want to look for an, a startup that does this sort of stuff. Long term, in my opinion, this is the technology that's going to win. Why, why are arrays such a great idea? Well, besides that the linear algebra is defined on them, the thing is, is that lots of times you want to subset an array. Uh, so I want, some, I want to carve some chunk out of the middle of a, an array, like the stuff on the top right. So the nice thing about array storage is you can chunk the storage into disk blocks in multiple dimensions at the same time. So you can have a stride in x, a stride in y. You don't store the dimensions unless things are really sparse. You get a compact representation that's searchable in multiple dimensions and does linear algebra really fast. <coughs> a relational simulation is fundamentally difficult. You have to store the dimensions. That's the i and j. And it's, and it's impossible to cluster a table in multiple dimensions at the same time, at least current, arrays, current relational systems. So arrays have a fundamental native advantage in this world. So we'll see what happens. Uh, so I can't leave this topic without talking about Hadoop. Uh, I, I'm, of course, on record for thinking Hadoop sucks. <laughs> so if you said, well, what, what was Hadoop all about in circa 2010? Well, Hadoop was a thing called HDFS. That's a file system. On top of the file system, there was a thing called MapReduce, which was written by Google. Google wrote MapReduce. It was purpose-built to support their crawl database. So this was an application-specific world for a specific application. And then on top of this, people put things like Hive. Think of that as SQL. They put Pig. Think of that as SQL. Uh, Mahout. Think of that as complex analytics or other SQL-like things. OK, so that's what we're talking about circa 2010. What everybody quickly found out was that MapReduce is not an interesting distributed computing platform for all kinds of very good technical reasons. We wrote a paper in 2007 saying MapReduce is not an interesting interface in a in a uh, SQL database system for all kinds of good technical reasons. So MapReduce is no good at distributed computing, and it's no good at data management. And that quickly became apparent to most everybody. So what's happened since 2010? Well, Google abandoned MapReduce for the application for which it was purpose built. So they moved to Bigtable. And they have to be laughing in their beer, saying, we, we abandoned MapReduce about five years ago. Uh, and, we, and they've now publicly said it has no place in their future st stack. They've written a bunch of interesting database systems, like Dremel and F1, that have nothing to do with MapReduce, nothing at all. So Google has abandoned MapReduce. Uh, Cloudera. Uh, although they don't quite publicly admit what I'm about to tell you, has abandoned MapReduce. Why is that? Well, Impala, which is a SQL database system that they've written, a reasonably good one written by smart guys, it's their new database system, it is not built on MapReduce at all. And why is that? Well, a parallel SQL data warehouse system 
MapReduce is not a good interface in the middle of such a database system. And that has been well known by database researchers for years and years. So Impala is not built on MapReduce. In fact, a dirty little secret is Impala is not even built on HDFS. So it's completely on its own stack. So Cloudera is abandoning MapReduce. Hortonworks and Facebook have similar projects. So the world is abandoning MapReduce. So what is the future of the Hadoop stack? <clears throat> well, you could say if we weren't in a marketing central kind of world, well, MapReduce is a bad idea, so let's just move on, like Google moved on. And the companies that are supporting MapReduce should just go away and do something else. Well, of course, you can't do that if you're Cloudera. So you redefine the Hadoop stack to mean not MapReduce anymore. So that's exactly what's happened. So the Hadoop stack circa 2015 is HDFS at the bottom, sort of. Uh, HDFS has horrible performance problems and is being drilled through to the, anybody who cares drills right through that layer into the underlying Linux file system. And that seems to be getting fixed as people rewrite HDFS completely. Uh, SQL is at the top, which is uh, the Hadoop stack is fundamentally turning into a SQL data warehouse market. So you've got a data warehouse style executor available from Impala, which is Cl Cloudera, which is a Hadoop vendor, or from the data warehouse guys who are happy to run on top of HDFS and drill through HDFS into Linux files just like they've always done. So the data warehouse market and the Hadoop market are the same market going forward. And may the best vendors win. Uh, the uh, business intelligence market is alive and well until it gets replaced by the data science market. And may the Hadoop vendors compete against the data warehouse guys. May the best systems win. Now, that hasn't stopped the Hadoop vendors from another tactic, which is something called data lakes. So stay tuned, I will talk about data lakes, which is the other marketing thrust of the Hadoop guys. Okay, so I have to now talk about Spark. So where did Spark come from? Well, if you're gonna do distributed computing, I said two slides ago that MapReduce was a horrible solution. And so Matei Zahari is a smart guy. He's currently at, at MIT. And so Spark was conceived as a faster, more functional version of MapReduce. That's absolutely true. It's faster and more functional than MapReduce. However, one thing that the Spark guys quickly found out is that just like Hadoop is a SQL market, so is Spark. 70% of all the accesses, according to Matei Zaharia, is in Spark SQL. So, so more than two thirds of the accesses are SQL. So if you're a database guy and you take a look at Spark SQL, the first thing you say is, huh, where's the beef? Uh, there are no transactions. There's no sharing. If, if, uh, if you have a real, data warehouse database system and you have two people that are both accessing the same table, they're running off the same, the same instance of that table. Not so in Spark SQL. If uh, JAG is, doing, is operating on one table, I'm operating on another, we have two different copies. So there's no sharing, there's no persistence, uh, which makes database people absolutely uh, see red. Uh, until recently, there were no indexes. There's no system catalogs. Uh, this is the, a toy of a SQL engine. Now, presumably, this stuff is all going to get fixed. Uh, and so, uh, in my opinion, what's very likely to happen is uh, Databricks and, and other vendors will fix all this by re-architecting uh, Spark completely, because this is going to take a complete re-architecting of the way Spark works. And over time, Spark will compete in the data warehouse market against the Hadoop vendors, against the warehouse vendors. May the best system win. 
30% of the Spark market is distributed computing, mostly coming from Scala at this point. So uh, resilient distributed data, RDDs, which is the Spark uh, data model, uh, is, is already largely being replaced by data frames. Uh, Spark is a Java framework. However, if what you're trying to do is matrix multiply, well, current Spark is a lousy way to do that. You're a couple orders of magnitude off of the, what's performance possible, uh, largely because there isn't optimized array storage and there isn't optimized matrix operations. So uh, the way to think about this is that if you write matrix multiply in Python and you compare its performance with writing matrix multiply in Intel optimized uh, C, you know, C, five orders of magnitude performance difference, five. So you want to write stuff in, uh, and the one order of magnitude is from the Intel hardware engineers way down in the weeds diddling stuff. Uh, another two orders of magnitude is the difference between C and Java and so forth. So you, if you want to go scalably and not give up two orders of magnitude in performance, all that stuff is going to have to get into Spark or people are going to run things like PsyDB, which already has this. So presumably this too will get fixed over time. So again, it's going to take a complete re-architecting of Spark. So hold on to your seatbelt. We'll see what Spark turns into. I remember in 2010, we were all standing here saying MapReduce is the answer. In 2015, Spark is the answer. Uh, we'll see what things are like in 2020. Okay, that's the end of my tirade on uh, Hadoop, Spark, and other such things. Let's turn to the big velocity market, which is the data is coming at you too fast. How, why is that happening? Well, we are in the process of sensor tagging everything of value to report its uh, state or, loca uh, or location in real time. So every single vendor on the planet is putting a sensor in your car to report exactly where and how you drive and then use that to personalize your car insurance rates. Uh, Progressive Insurance has been doing this for a decade. Everyone else is following suit. Uh, you know, if you're a marathon runner, your bib is sensor tagged so that they can keep people from cheating on the Boston Marathon. Uh, so the Internet of Things is sending velocity through the roof. Uh, smartphones as a mobile platform, uh, it's to no surprise that uh, Foursquare allows you to tell everybody where, you know, exactly where you're at so that you can, you know, find your friends. <coughs> and uh, I don't play World of Warcraft, but uh, my friend Stan Zidonic's son is addicted to it. A and the state of multiplayer internet games uh, has to be recorded. Uh, that's a big velocity problem as everybody is clicking around, shooting at whatever they shoot at in that game. <laughs> so big, big velocity is going to be a bigger and bigger problem. So what do we do if, if the data is coming at you too fast? Well, there's two different solutions that, that, uh, that tackle totally different versions of this problem. The first one is I can explain in, in electronic trading. So electronic trading, guys, I want to find a banana followed within 100 milliseconds by a strawberry or vice versa, whatever. So I'm looking for patterns in a fire hose that's coming at you. So I'm looking for patterns, and all I want to do is find the pattern and then take some action. Uh, what's called complex event processing is focused on this market. Uh, there have been a bunch of solutions from the database guys largely about 10 years ago. Streambase was one I worked on. There have been a bunch of others. More recently, there's been Storm and Kafka and a bunch of other sort of stream processing engines. So if you want to do 
uh, look for patterns in a fire hose, use one of these products. All of these systems will run a million uh, messages a second or so, and I don't know I don't know hardly anybody who wants to run faster than that. So use the CEP system if you want to look for patterns in a fire hose. The other solution, which I'm much more interested in, is uh, it turns out uh, there's a company called Getco in Chicago. They do electronic trading. They're responsible for about 10% of the volume on the New York Stock Exchange, that one company. And they do, they do electronic trading. They have a trading desk in Tokyo, another one in Hong Kong, another one in London, another one in New York, and so forth. So they have a whole bunch of them around the world that are running independently, sort of deciding, doing electronic trading. Now, the CEO of Getco is worried about risk, which is if all of these different independent trading engines all decide to short IBM, that generates a lot of risk, and especially if they're shorting it big time. So what he wants is to assemble his real time, meaning at one millisecond by one millisecond granularity, assemble Getco's global position for or against every stock on the planet. And he wants to be alerted if, the, if his risk gets too high, if his exposure in any given stock is greater than a certain number. So that's his application. He's not looking for a pattern in a fire hose. He's simply trying to process the fire hose and record state. Because that's his, his position for or against every stock is state. The problem is he can't lose any messages. The minute he loses a message, this whole thing you know, is blown out of the water. So this looks like high performance online transaction processing, which is in comes a message, do an update, never lose my data. So you want to update a database at very, very high speed. So this is the other version of the problem. If you're looking for a pattern in the fire hose, if you develop amnesia, lose some messages, well, you know, so what? You just lost the opportunity to make some money. In this case, you, can't, you, you need transactions, you can't lose messages. So this is the other version of the problem. So how am I going to solve this problem? Because I find this one much more interesting. So you need to do OLTP fast. So one option is to just run the legacy SQL vendors, who I affectionately call the elephants. So run Oracle or run MySQL or run you know, MariaDB, run Postgres, run your favorite relational database system. Second option is there's by now probably 100 NoSQL vendors who, who position themselves as offering NoSQL. What that means is they are all advocating that you give up SQL and run in some other lower level language and you give up ACID. <clears throat> so you could run one of those guys or you can run a, a product from a collection of vendors who are called NoSQL vendors who say retain SQL, retain ACID, but go fast with a totally different kind of implementation. I'm going to talk about all three of these solutions. Uh, why not use Oracle? Uh, if you walk into Getco and say, how about running Oracle to maintain my real-time state, they'll laugh at you because you're a couple orders of magnitude too slow. So you, you, can, you can certainly run old SQL, but the legacy architectures that are now about 30 years old uh, have a collection of architectural and implementation decisions largely around their tr support for transactions that make them you know, upper bounded in how fast they can go. So if you want to look into all kinds of technical reasons, uh, we wrote a paper in, that appeared in VLDB in 2007 called Through the OLTP Looking Glass, which explains why legacy vendors simply cannot go fast uh, in this sort of world. So uh, old SQL is too slow. Well, the whole idea behind the NoSQL guys was you're too slow. So they have two different solutions. First solution is give up SQL. Uh, second solution is give up transactions. Uh, 
Now, I have a lot of gray hair. I can remember when people were s said, you have got to code an IBM assembler because unless you can control the registers, you can't go fast. As we all know, betting against the compiler is a really, really bad idea. And that's what these guys are doing, which is SQL compiles into the low-level utterances that the NoSQL guys say you should just implement in these low-level utterances. They are betting against the compiler. That is a terrible idea. Uh, it has been proved over and over again that SQL compilers, as well as general purpose uh, C++ compilers, produce almost as good code as the best programmers can possibly produce themselves. Betting against the compiler is a lousy idea. So how about giving up ACID? Well, against the traditional legacy vendors, ACID is one of their big problems. Their implementations of ACID are very slow. So if you don't need ACID, this is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. If you do need ACID, this is a decision to tear your hair out by trying to do transactions in user space. Now, there's a famous example on MongoDB, which is one of the NoSQL guys. Uh, MongoDB was used as the database system behind a Bitcoin uh, storage repository. And there, wa there was an attack by some smart person who was exploiting the fact that they didn't really have transactions and he swiped all their, bit, their Bitcoins. So if you don't have transactions and you need transactions, then the corner cases are devastatingly bad. So uh, if, you, if you need transactions, you've got to do a lot of user code, and that code is a fate worse than death. Moreover, can you guarantee you're not going to need transactions tomorrow? Because if you need them tomorrow, uh, then the NoSQL guys aren't going to give them to you. Now, it's interesting to note that uh, there's 75 or so vendors. You've got to have standards. No, no one is going to ever support 75 different interfaces. So uh, it's interesting to note that two of the big guys in the space, Cassandra and MongoDB, are moving to, yeah, SQL. So, so in my opinion, SQL and NoSQL are really going to merge. Uh, <laughs> NoSQL in 2012, the marketing pitch was, SQL is terrible. You don't want it. Their pitch changed a year or so later into, well, not only SQL. Well, SQL is good for some things, but we're good for other things. And in my opinion, where we are now is the NoSQL means not yet SQL. So the SQL guys are adding JSON, meaning support for uh, sparse kinds of objects, and they're improving their out-of-box experience. The NoSQL guys are adding SQL and transactions, and in my opinion, these markets are going to merge. And NoSQL and SQL will, will have uh, smaller and smaller distinction over time. Uh, the third option is to, is to run a new SQL engine uh, MemSQL, VaultDB, NuoDB, there's a bunch of them. <coughs> they all take the point of view that the 30-year-old architectures that the elephants are selling are 30-year-old legacy code. This isn't good for much of anything anymore. And all you have to do is implement high-speed transactions uh, using modern technology. And especially taking advantage of main memory uh, as a way to go wildly faster than disk. So the new SQL guys say SQL is good, ACID is good. You can make this stuff go fast, but you can't do it with Oracle uh, or, or MariaDB or uh, dot, dot, dot. So I'm a big fan of new SQL. I think the old SQL guys are slow. The no SQL guys are going to move to SQL. And uh, if you want to go fast, the new SQL guys are wildly faster than the no SQL guys. So VaultDB is about a factor of seven faster than Cassandra on the stuff Cassandra can do. OK, 
So that's what I have to say about big velocity. Uh, I think it's either a stream problem or it's a high-speed OLTP problem. And I think if you want to run a million transactions a second, VoltDB can do it. Uh, if you want to process a million messages a second, Streambase or Kafka can do it. So I think this, this big, big velocity world, I think, is reasonably solvable uh, these days with commercial products. So now I want to turn to big variety. So a typical enterprise, so think FedEx. FedEx has 5,000 operational data systems. Now, everybody on the planet has a data warehouse. That gets loaded from operational systems. And I've talked to a lot of warehouse administrators, and I say, well, how many operational systems are sending you data that you're integrating into your data warehouse? The typical answer is a number less than 10, which says that 4,990 of these operational systems are simply silos and don't get integrated into a data warehouse. So a few of these get into a data warehouse. There's enormous pressure from business analysts to get more and more stuff into their data warehouses so that they can do better and better business intelligence. Uh, also, everybody's you know, the CFO of most companies actually produces his budget in Excel. So he's got spreadsheets. That, that's interesting data, which isn't shareable. Uh, there's low-end access databases. And then the public web is a treasure trove of all kinds of stuff. So just for example, uh, I got to pay a sales call at Miller Beer a while ago. Uh, those are the guys in Milwaukee. And they, this was a, in, right about this time of year, in a, in a year in which El Nino was predicted by the weather guys to, uh, to be a very strong El Nino year. By the way, this year, coming year, is also an El Nino year. So the weather guys have figured out that El Nino, which is this warm weather upwelling, uh, warm water upwelling in the Pacific, uh, screws up the U.S. weather every few years. So I said, well, El Nino is coming. And uh, the weather guys are saying, well, it's going to be wetter than normal on the West Coast, and it's going to be warmer than normal in the Northeast. Hey, guys, Miller Beer guys, uh, are beer sales correlated with uh, precipitation or temperature? And the data analyst, you know, the business intelligence guy says, Wow, I'd really like to know the answer to that question. But of course, weather data wasn't in the warehouse. And so the business intelligence guys have this insatiable demand for more stuff. And there's huge amounts of it available from the public web. So huge pressure to get more and more data sources into a composite global schema. So what's the traditional gold standard for how to do data integration? Well, it's something called extract, transform, and load, ETL products. And, here's, and they come from people like Informatica. I, IBM has a thing called uh, you know, Information Integrator. And Talend is an open source system, same area. So here's the way they all say. Take your smartest programmer and have him construct a global schema in advance. So up front, here's the global schema that I'm going to try and integrate to. For each local data source, send a programmer. So send Barzan out to find the business owner, figure out what data he's got, figure out what format it's in, figure out how to scrape it off of wherever it is, uh, figure out how to map it to this global schema that has been predefined, and write a script to, to move it. Uh, along the way, he'll probably have to do some transformations. Uh, these are things like euros to dollars or feet to, you know, feet to meters or whatever. So people never agree on the same units. And then you've got to figure out how to clean it because about 10% of your data is wrong, just round numbers, which is the address is obsolete or 
you're using nicknames, uh, Mike Stonebreaker rather than Michael Stonebreaker and so forth. And, I, and entities may be in multiple of these data sources, so you've got to figure out how to do entity consolidation. So all of that falls to Barzan as the programmer who's trying to suck in this data source. And this is a huge amount of human heavy lifting. And so this works for 10 data sources. If you twist my arm, I'll give you 20. But the problem is there's too much heavy lifting with a trained programmer. It gets too expensive. <clears throat> the other thing that happens is that uh, enter enterprises in the past have tried to create enterprise-wide global schema. That was a popular thing to do about 15 years ago. So you'd send out a team of five people to go out and try and build this global schema. So they'd spend three or four years, because you've got 5,000 data sources you've got you to go investigate. Uh, that, is, that, that composite schema was out of date on day one because the business moved on, let alone four years later. So every single one of those projects failed. And so the bottom line is that constructing a broad scale global schema up front is, is impossible. And there's too much manual heavy lifting to get there, even if you could come up with a global schema. So this is hopeless. I mean, anyone who wants to do a scalable number of data sources dismisses this technology as completely hopeless. So who wants to scale past 10 or so data sources? So here's just a few examples. Uh, Novartis, which is a big drug, drug company, uh, big operation in Cambridge, headquartered in Switzerland. Uh, they have a traditional data warehouse of customer facing data from 10 or so data sources. However, they've got 10,000 bench scientists doing wet stuff, biologists and chemists, and the company wants to put together the experimental results from 10,000, think of these as electronic notebooks. They want to do this to figure out if Barzan, you know, who's in a lab in, in Basel, Switzerland, and I'm in a lab in Cambridge, Massachusetts, if we're both trying to produce the same gook, uh, we want to be able to you know, do social networking with each other. Social networking, put together 10,000, think of these as spreadsheets. Uh, Toyota Motors Europe, uh, right now they have a customer database in every country in Europe. These are in 14 different languages, by the way. They have a Romanian database uh, in Romania, in Romanian. Uh, and they want to be able to track their customers as they move from France to Spain and so forth. So they want to do customer care across countries, which requires them to integrate 50 or 75 of these databases in 14 languages. Uh, Groupon, the daily deal guys uh, that you've probably heard of, they are in the process of building a worldwide small business database. They're doing this by scraping 10,000 web data sources and then cleaning up the result and putting it together. Uh, General Electric has 325 procurement systems. So if you want to buy paper clips, you go to your procurement system and that tells you uh, go down to Staples and give them this kind of purchase order. So General Electric has figured out they can save $100 million a year if they can just do the following. If you're one of these purchasing guys uh, and the renewal for Staples comes up, if you can find out what the terms and conditions are from your other 324 counterparts and then just demand most favored nation status, you'll, they'll save $100 million a year. It requires you to put together 325 of these supplier databases. So doing this at scale is an open problem in my opinion. So the ETL guys are, not, are, are just never going to get, that isn't, that is just, you're not, that isn't going to happen. So there's a bunch of startups who are doing interesting stuff. Uh, I'm involved in a company called Tamer, T-A-M-R, uh, which is oriented toward the enterprise and doing, doing a lot of these 
uh, doing a lot of uh, data systems. Uh, There's a bunch of folks, uh, Alteryx, Trifacta, which is Joey Hellerstein's company, dot, 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 which are oriented towards supporting individual data scientists at the low end. Uh, I think that this is a space where there's a lot of new ideas that ought to come into existence. Uh, <clears throat> I only have a minute or two left, so uh, what does data curation really mean? So what do you have to do if you want to put two data sources together? So you've got to ingest it like we talked about way back in the HDFS world. You've got to do transformations like if Barzan is the human resources guy in Paris and I'm the human resources guy in New York, uh, he's dealing in euros, I'm dealing in dollars. We've got to transform one to the other. You've got to clean stuff up. People make all kinds of stupid mistakes, like minus 99. Uh, what you often mean is that that's a code word for null, but it's not written down anywhere. Uh, your wages is my salary. I've got to do schema mapping. Uh, and then the toughest one is probably is Mike Stonebreaker and Michael Stonebreaker, by the way, misspelled. Uh, are they the same entity or are they different entities? So you've got to do deduplication. Historically, this has been incredibly expensive. <clears throat> so Tamer is an end-to-end -end curation system, uses machine learning and statistics to pick the low-hanging fruit automatically. You have to be able to ask a human. In the Novartis case, there's an ICE50 and an ICU50. They're both genetic terms. Are they the same? Are they synonyms for each other or not? Only a domain expert knows. A trained programmer has no clue. So you've got to leverage a crowdsourcing system of domain experts. And this appears to have a, a great ROI relative to ETL. Uh, we're alive and well sort of trying to make this uh, happen. So now I can come back to data lakes. So dump all your raw data into HDFS, which is the data lake story from the, from the Hadoop vendors. Uh, this means ingest your data into the data lake. That leaves you with transform it, clean it, do schema mapping, and do deduplication. That's all yet to come. Uh, and the ingest is the easy piece. The rest of it is much harder. And so uncurated data is simply a junk drawer. So that's a data swamp. Uh, and curation is, is the 800-pound gorilla in the corner. So a data lake is a great idea. However, the Hadoop vendors are not getting you there at all. Uh, they're just saying do the ingest piece. And the rest of it is data curation. OK. So the takeaway is, uh, if you're an enterprise, you're going to be running a bunch of different data systems. If you want to do business intelligence, you're going to run a column store. Uh, over time, my suspicion is that if you want to do complex analytics, you're going to run an array store. If you want to do streaming, as in pattern recognition, you're going to have a streaming engine. Uh, if you're going to uh, try and maintain state transactionally, you're going to need a new SQL system. At the low end, no SQL vendors are easy to use. Uh, they're pretty good at semi-structured data. The SQL guys are getting much better at it. This is all on top of a, of a whole bunch of legacy systems that are already there, which are largely obsolete. And everybody is going to be running one or more curation engines over time. And so you're going to be running all of this stuff. And the key thing is to use the right tool for the right job. So I always get asked, what am I working on? Uh, first of all, I'm working on the next edition of the Red Book. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> this will be available next week. Uh, it'll be electronic. We're not, no more paper publishing. It's free, no more cost. Uh, I'm working on the 800-pound gorilla, which is, I think, to me, this is the hardest big data problem by far, the one where there's the most leverage. Uh, I'm also working on distributed transactions. Uh, I'm beginning to have the opinion that uh, if you have transactions that span multiple nodes in a computer network, there is no way to make them fast. Because we've tried everybody's algorithms, and none of them 
have, none of them have the property that multiple nodes outperform one node uh, over a, a variety of use cases. Uh, I always get asked what, what, what's on the horizon that's hardware interesting. Uh, so I think RDMA could be interesting. It'll produce faster networking. Will it change how database systems think about distributed uh, multi-node database systems? That remains to be seen. That's an interesting thing to take a look at. Uh, Non-volatile RAM is here. Uh, it'll be here next year. Will it be fast enough and cheap enough to make a big difference in the way people are architecting database systems? So I think those are two things that are fascinating to take a look at and may in fact change all the ground rules and cause me to give a much different talk next year. That's the end of my slides. Thank you very much. I am putting the steering wheel on because it's not self-driving yet. So in order to move it back to the lab, we have to shamefully put the steering wheel back on. <laughs>